Mandated or not, masks are coming back. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Daryl Rowland, senior editor for the Columbus Dispatch, Shannon Jones, former state legislator and president of Groundwork Ohio, and Desiree Timms, president of Innovation Ohio. Ohio is not yet a hot spot for the spread of COVID and the Delta variant, but it's getting warmer. This is the CDC COVID transmission map. The red counties signify a high rate of spread, the orange counties substantial rate of spread, and the yellow is the moderate rate of spread. Franklin there, outlined in gray, is in the substantial category, and that's why city and county health officials strongly recommend everyone, even those vaccinated, wear a mask at indoor public spaces. We don't know how long this pandemic is going to last, and we don't know what the next variant will be and how serious it will be. But we do know what we can do to slow the spread of this virus, and that's to get vaccinated and to put a mask on. Robert says the city would have imposed a mask mandate, but a new state law prevents it from doing so. While Governor DeWine pleads with people to get vaccinated and wear a mask, he wore one himself, state government won't issue any orders. We are at the point today in regard to this um, pandemic, uh, well over a year into it, uh, where individual choices is the most important thing. It's where we are. Uh, we have the vaccine, and, and so people can choose to get that vaccine. They, we also have, they know the power of masks. They can make those decisions. Institutions can make those decisions. Daryl Rowland, no incentives, no mandates, just strong recommendations is tough government action, Daryl. Where we are right now, we don't expect anything stronger from the state government or even local governments at this point. I think you heard the, that was the key sound clip. Uh, individual choice, uh, the governor says, is, you know, is the key here. Uh, that means, in my mind, no mandates on vaccines, no mandates on masks. Uh, now, of course, he's got a legislature that has clipped his wings a bit in, in that power and also that of local health departments and other government entities. Uh, so it's, it's pretty much on a piecemeal basis. Uh, higher education, Ohio State, um, Ohio U, Miami have all instituted mask mandates, uh, even for the vaccinated indoors. Uh, several public schools in central Ohio, Columbus, uh, Gahanna, Westerville. Worthington have done the same, but there's nothing as far as a universal uh, mandate or anything at this point. Shannon Jones, the, the vaccination daily rate, the number of Ohioans getting a vaccine each day has ticked up a bit. It's it's up from 20, 30 percent over where it was at the at the low point right after in the early in May or June. Do you think people are starting to get the message? Is recommend our recommendations going to be enough to get that vaccination rate up? Well, we see that that's actually happening. And so, you know, for every subsequent person um, to go get the, the vaccine, I mean, these are people by definition that have been vaccine hesitant for whatever reason or another. So they are harder to get. Um, but clearly, as we've seen the increase in vaccination rates, um, you know, there we know what to do now. It's It's people feeling that, um, pressure, that motivation to, to go and get it done. Desiree, Tim's even Joe Biden is recommending masks. They're not talking about a national mask mandates or vaccine mandates or anything like that for most people, for the general public. And the thinking is that mandates will just make people mad and they just tune you out and they, they won't be convinced. Is, is there truth to that statement? Have we learned that during this pandemic? I think President Biden is allowing states um, and the leaders to lead and make that decision. Look, we know that people on the receiving end are making the decision to not get vaccinated and to not wear masks because of disinformation campaigns. It is so important that we be clear and we provide clear guidance and tell everyone to get vaccinated. And really, I look forward and hope that more institutions will require mask mandates to keep us all safe. We shouldn't have to wait until people die around us uh, to feel some sort of encouragement. Yeah, there a lot of institutions have instituted the mask mandates. Several companies, Ohio State University has, uh, 
Daryl, when it comes to the vaccine mandates now, that's that's a little trickier because we're still in the, you know, the emergency designation for these vaccines, not full FDA approval. But healthcare systems are starting to mandate their employees get them. Uh, even Children's Hospital, Nationwide Children's Hospital is going to give their employees up to a thousand dollar bonus, the non-medical staff, if they get the vaccine be- between now and October. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, again, going with the theme of the, the governor, uh, the, the individual choice. Um, in this case, it's individual institutions. Uh, but we, we certainly saw the Central Ohio, the, the big hospital groups, all fall into line with uh, their vaccine mandates. Uh, the State Hospital Association backed them up, so they, you know, they favored the same thing. The Ohio State uh, Medical Association, the, obviously the statewide doctors, are, are in accord as well. So that seems to be where the action is right now. Shannon, should, give, should government get involved in these mandates? Should, like, say, not necessarily for employees, a company mandating their employer, employees get the vaccine, but say if a company like the Ohio Theater says you can't come in unless you're vaccinated, is that a role where government might step in? Look, I think that we're, what we're seeing is the trend is that private business is starting to step in. Um, And whether or not the government should do it or not, I think is really beside the point at this juncture. I mean, arguably government stepped in uh, very early on and took some aggressive action. And, you you know, people have, have been pushing back on that for a really long time. And now what you're seeing is the private sector is filling in where where perhaps the public sector left off. Because as you point out, it's Republicans and Democrats alike that have been reluctant to, to impose mandates. It's not because they necessarily think they're, that getting vaccination is bad or wearing masks are bad. It's that they just don't think the peop- they're, you know, that everybody will follow it. And so, you know, this is a this is a different tactic that I think is perfectly appropriate um, for private industry to step in and perhaps fill the void. Desiree, if you look at the stats, it's the people who are the least vaccinated, at least the percentage wise are folks say between 20 and 45. So the younger folks, less susceptible to the serious consequences of COVID. A lot of these folks may not have time to go get vaccinated. Their jobs maybe working two jobs or you know, just a little bit lazy or procrastinating. What can we do? Can we get into the, like, to the communities at, at festivals and workplaces to get the vaccines out there? I absolutely think we need a grassroots approach to outreach to ensuring more young people have access to the vaccine and that they have access to information. We have seen the impact and the implications of disinformation campaigns and unfortunately young people Uh, Black and Hispanic people, we're seeing communities of color disproportionately impacted by these disinformation campaigns. They're confused. And so we have to be very clear in our messaging and our communications. And I think grassroots outreach um, is the best way to go about ensuring we increase those vaccination rates amongst those groups. Dale, you mentioned the schools. I mean, I've talked to several parents of young kids and they're going to ask that they will make their kids wear a mask to school, even in districts where it's optional and they're worried that their kids will get picked on because they're wearing a mask or perhaps other kids will get picked on because they're not wearing a mask because that's going to leave school teachers and administrators in a tough spot when school classes start uh, in the next couple of weeks. Well, that's a real dilemma. I, I happen to have grandchildren in, in that age, that 12 and under, where there is no choice to get a vaccine. It's Nothing's been approved, even provisionally, of course. Um, so yeah, we're we're at the cusp of another school year, and you know, schools are still. Who thought we'd be here a year later? It seems like you know, like last year, stay open, stay closed, require this, not require that. It's happening again in 2021. We this is part of the frustrating part of this. I think for a lot of people, Mike, we thought we had this almost whip. The mask came off. Not many of us burned them. Some did. Yeah. <laughs> um, but now we're right back in, in in the stew again, at least to, to some extent, and. It's really frustrating. And then when you got your kids involved, your grandkids involved, that just brings it home. It's just like, oh, can we get through this? Yeah. I heard one suggestion today. You have you split the classes up. You have a classroom of masked kids and a classroom of unmasked kids. I'm not sure that's a solution either. But anyway, like they used to do in stadiums with the vaccine and unvaccinated. We're, there was voting this week here in Central Ohio. Primary voters this week chose finalists for the special election for the 15th Congressional District. 
On the Democratic side, State Rep Allison Russo of Upper Arlington easily beat retired Army officer Greg Betts. Certainly no surprise there. The real race was on the Republican side, where a total of 10 candidates want to succeed, wanted to succeed Steve Stivers, who left office this spring. The Trump-endorsed candidate Mike Carey won fairly easily, well ahead of his closest competitors. State Rep Jeff LeRae, former State Rep Ron Hood, State Senator Bob Peterson, and former Columbus NAACP President Ruth Edmonds. The other candidates, including State Senator Stephanie Kunze of Hilliard, were in single-digit percentages well back. Shannon Jones, you've been watching this race pretty closely since uh, Stivers left office and the field solidified. What's your takeaway on this? Was the Trump endorsement the deciding factor? Well, I mean, look, we always argue that and know for a fact that that primaries are base, um, you know, base races. I mean, the, that's where the base comes out. And in these special elections, where there's even fewer people coming out to vote, They're, they happen, you know, not on a traditional um, uh, ca election calendar. Um, you know, the ones that are coming out to vote are the ones that are most motivated. And so, you know, I don't think that it's that surprising that Mike Carey won, given uh, President Trump's um, uh, participation in the race with a lot of outside resources and his endorsement. Um, but but I think that there's some interesting things that happen in that race. You know, uh, you've had candidates that that Ron Hood, um, he was nowhere to be found on the campaign trail. And yet he garnered as much support, uh, statistically speaking, as the um, backed candidate of the in former incumbent, Steve Stivers. Yeah, um, So there are you know, these are really funny races and they're, it's hard to glean anything um, from a special election and, and interpret it to mean something for the upcoming uh, election cycle. Yeah, I, I always say let's let's analyze this election that only 14 percent turned out is in the you know first week of August. But let's go it anyway. Daryl, if you add up the, the votes of the next four competitors underneath Mike Carey, that number beats him by a thousand votes. Was it a fact that the non-Trump, they all wanted to beat Trump, embraced by Trump, but the non-Trump candidates just split the vote and that cleared the way for Mike Carey? I, I don't know if you can really call anyone a non-Trump candidate, at least among that top tier. Um, I mean, there was certainly no one defying them. So it was like, I think, as, as former Senator Jones observed, it's, uh, you know, it was the Trump endorsed candidate and then maybe it was Trump white. I, I don't know. But clearly those, those ads at the were cut with the president personally endorsing someone, I think carried the day. Um, perhaps a more interesting question is, will that carry the day in the fall now when we get a general election? Again, it's, it's a special election since it's an odd numbered year. Um, does Allison Russo have a chance in this district? A lot of national commentators are already writing uh, the, the Upper Arlington State Rep off saying, you know, it's a red district. And indeed, Donald Trump won it by double digits a couple times. Um, so a lot of it's going to depend, I think, on whether Representative Russo can attract some national money, uh, maybe a little like Danny O'Connor did in the 12th Congressional District Special Election, uh, you know, a couple of cycles ago. Yeah. Desiree Timms, the, the Cook Partisan Report analysis rates this district, the 15th district, as a plus nine Republican, meaning that Republicans have a built in nine point lead, generic candidates. But do Democrats welcome the chance to go against the super endorsed Trump candidate? Does that open a door in particular with suburban folks? I mean, the turnout in Franklin County in this election was only 10%. So not many folks from Western Franklin County turned out for this special, for the primary anyway. Well, what we know is that people who do show up for uh, primary elections are uh, politically more partisan than the general electorate. And so I think Democrats are not going to shy away from an opportunity to flip this seat from red to blue. And we're going to be really optimistic about uh, what Russo will do in, in our plus nine district is certainly uh, going to be an uphill battle, but we've seen seats flip um, that are far more than our plus nine. And so I think we ought to be open to the possibility of most voters are in the middle. Um, and so I don't think the Trump effect 
will really uh, truly speak to the people of the 15th district. Desiree, this, will, this November election will be in an odd year. So you, normally we're not electing Congress people or statewide offices in an odd numbered year. It's a city election for the most part. Does that help or hurt your effort to, the Democrats effort to upset uh, the Republican in this race? I think it may help because people will turn out uh, in November. People pay more attention. They know that, hey, November it means voting time. Um, it's really difficult to get voters to turn out for primaries and for special elections when it's outside of November. It's warm outside. People are vacationing. November, people are a little more glued to the TV. And so hopefully um, with the right spending and investment in commercials and ad buying that Russo is able to get her message out uh, to flip the seat from red to blue. Shannon, were you surprised that uh, State Senator Stephanie Kunze from Hilliard didn't do better? She was well back. She's, you know, she was the Franklin County candidate in a seat that is now held by a person from Franklin County, but she didn't, was not competitive, really. So, look, I, I think that, you know, in a really narrowly cast uh, electorate um, that is divided by so many candidates, um, it's not really surprising that you know, she didn't do as well um, as she would have hoped. I mean, Franklin County just doesn't, you know, outweigh all of those other more rural counties that make up the district. And in a base election, um, the base was looking for more traditional conservative credentials than Stephanie Kunze really had. Yeah. Okay, it was not in Central Ohio, but there was another special primary this week in Cleveland to fill the seat left vacant when Marsha Fudge moved into the Biden administration. The Democrat-dominated district prompted a spirited primary between the establishment candidate and the fiery progressive candidate. In the end, the establishment Democrat won. Cuyahoga County Councilmember Chantel Brown beat former state Senator Nita Turner by a relatively comfortable margin. And in the end... The uh, establishment candidate won. Desiree Timms, you surprised by that, or she had? A, I mean, Chantel had a lot of backing. I think both Chantel and Nina uh, Turner had a lot of backing and a lot of support. They were two dynamic candidates, two black women with track records of public service to that community, and the voters had a really tough choice because they had two great options. And they chose Chantel. And so I, I was really excited either way uh, to see that district have representation following Secretary Fudge's exit. And so they had a tough choice. The voters made that choice. I don't care how many national pundits tried to, to make predictions and outcomes after spending, you know, two days in Cleveland and think they know everything about Ohio. Uh, this was about local politics and what the local people wanted and they voted and supported Chantel. So you don't think this is a signal that, you know, the progressive wing of the party is just not that because they've lost elections now in New York, Louisiana, Virginia, some pretty high profile races now in Ohio. It's is this the end of the progressive wing of the party for the next couple year or so? Desiree? I don't think this is about uh, progressivism versus, you know, moderates or establishment. This is about people choosing people they want to represent them. It is about kitchen table issues. I think nationally we've, uh, we've seen political pundits really dig into this, uh, which side of the party are you on, these false litmus tests. Voters don't know who's a progressive, who's a moderate, who's establishment and who's not. They hear the messaging. They meet the people on the ground. I've been a candidate on the ground and I'd never not once received that kind of question. They want to know, what are you going to do for me when you get to Washington? Are you going to fight for me? Are you going to help me get out of poverty? What are you going to do to change my school systems and my community? So I think that is sort of a false dichotomy um, that has really been created. And it's about the candidate's ability to communicate to voters on how they will deliver for them uh, once they are in elected office. Daryl Rowland, how, how do you view this race? There was some outside influence up there. Joyce Beatty from Central Ohio, the Congresswoman, also chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, was in support <clears throat> of Chantel Brown. What, what do you think happened up there? Yeah, as well as the, the caucus made an unusual endorsement, um, as is observed, between two uh, you know pretty attractive black candidates here. Uh, they, they chose Chantel Brown. Um, of course, Secretary Fudge, being a member of the cabinet, cannot legally or at least under the hatch at make an endorsement but her mother was on saying this is you know this is our candidate for Chantel Brown so 
I, I think those, those local connections really did play a role. And, you know, you, you, we talk about the, the national folks and, you know, I've been in that, that position going into another community in another state. And yeah, it's tough, the parachute journalism. Um, you know, the, the, the bit about the nationalized part of the race, I think there is definitely some truth to that. Uh, I think they missed a couple of things. One, there seemed to be this assumption that the African-American voters, and this is Ohio's only minority majority district, uh, congressional district, uh, they're automatically the far left voters. And so they're Nina Turner voters. And um, they were ignoring, I think, you just look back at the 2016 primary where Hillary Clinton beat Bernie Sanders by more than a two to one margin. Of course, uh, former Senator Turner went on to be one of Bernie Sanders' leading spokesperson, um, and Hillary Clinton was back to endorse Chantel Brown. Yeah. Uh, Shannon Jones, is it getting back to this whole debate, you know, the far left, the far right of a party, isn't it good to have a strong, I hate to use fringe, but a, a strong, you know, very liberal, very conservative part of the party to try to keep the party, the moderates, from going too far to the center? Isn't it a good thing to have strong right, strong left? Yeah, I mean, look, I think arguably in both of these districts, you had the establishment pick the candidate. I mean, Donald Trump is the establishment in the Republican Party, um, and he picked the candidate. And the establishment through the Black Caucus and some of these other local community folks picked their candidate. Um, and and so the 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 trying to make this liberal versus um uh pr progressive versus um, establishment i think is the wrong dichotomy but it is true that the democrat party has definitely shifted even its establishment has shifted way farther to the left so you know from from president biden on down i mean there in this last presidential election there has been a dramatic shift and so you know, I think progressives can take some credit for being a strong voice in the conversation and pushing the party to be way more progressive than it was even just a few years ago. Yeah. All right. When these Congress people run in 2022, they will have new districts or maybe no district. So will every state rep and state senator. The redistricting process officially got underway this week with the first meeting of the State Redistricting Commission. This is the panel which will draw the state districts. It's a bipartisan panel working under new rules approved by voters. The hope is this commission and the new rules will help draw districts that put voters and not the candidates advantage first. Shannon Jones, you are a veteran of one of these redistricting processes. Give us a peek behind the curtain. Is this commission going to really draw the map? Look, I, I think there's this is probably when you're talking about redistricting, it is literally the most basic, hardest core partisan process there is. I don't care what kind of constitutional amendments you put on there to try to improve the process. This is designed to be um, about politics. The people who are on the commission itself have a vested interest in the outcome of it. They're term limited politicians who are looking perhaps for a congressional seat or um, you, you might even have statewide office holders that are looking for a congressional run who are also term limited. And so, you know, the, this is going to be done in the back rooms where there's wheeling and dealing going on because redistricting at its core is the most partisan activity um, that the legislature uh, takes on. It's where the politicians pick their voters, but there are rules. They've got to keep like cities and townships and counties as in, you know as compact as possible. They can't break them up, so hopefully there will be a little less gerrymandering, but. They don't have to do it. They can just keep what they got and come back in four years. Wouldn't that be fun? All right, it's time now for our final off-the-record parting shots. And Desiree Timms, we will start with you. The COVID Delta variant is no joke, and I encourage everyone watching to encourage your neighbor or someone you know who hasn't been vaccinated to get the shot. I've been saying it again and again. Get the shot. All right, and Shannon Jones, your final thought. 
I think the redistricting commission, notwithstanding the challenges of timeline and data, um, they're going to come up with a map and it's going to be a 10 year map, too much pressure. Um, and, and, uh, we're not going to see a four year map. We're going to see a 10 year map. And Darrell, Rowland, your final thought. Uh, just a quick look at the, the Republican field in the, uh, race to succeed, uh, Senator Rob Portman. Uh, we mentioned the, the virus disinformation, uh, just today, one of those candidates, James Kem Kempkin, the former state Republican chairman, talked about how young people are not at risk. Now, we talk about less risk, maybe not as sick, but to say not at risk, there's a whole lot of parents out there that wish that were true across this country. And all of those candidates who want to succeed Rob Portman have come out against his bipartisan compromise infrastructure deal. So there's going to be a big change if they get in there. Yeah, it's uh, that that race now gets going. Well, certainly when the when the fall election is is over. Um, my final thought, uh, of course, the class of 2020 last year at Ohio State University and many colleges and high schools didn't have real graduations last year because of the pandemic. Well, this weekend, Saturday night, OSU brings back the class of 2020 to the horseshoe to celebrate their graduation that they didn't get last year and. Uh, I'll be there with our daughter Madeline and her friends uh, celebrating what we couldn't celebrate last year. So congratulations to all the folks from 2020 and the 2021 grads who would graduate on Sunday. You can watch both. If you're so inclined to watch a graduation this weekend, they'll be on WOSU.org. That's Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online, WOSU.org. You can stream us as well and Twitter and Facebook. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.